much for inviting me here today. This is an, an unbelievable honor. I just can't believe that I'm here talking to all of you that have strong personal connection to somebody in the fifth bomb group. And it's, it's really an honor for me to have met you over the course of the past few days. And I especially want to thank uh, the Ugaldi family for coming all the way from New Jersey and, uh, and, and joining this group. And I, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. And also, they have brought a cheesecake with them. So <laughs> I think you just guaranteed your invitations to all future reunions, I'm, I'm sure. And I also want to especially thank um, Jesse Unruh for coming. He actually wasn't, he had some other plans, he thought, and wasn't going to be able to make it, but but uh, came, drove up for the day, and uh, it's it's just wonderful. And uh, can't can't believe that about five months ago, we were in a jungle in New Guinea, and now to be here today meeting people with a real connection to the people on this plane. And so I'm going to share with you today the story of how that happened. So I think I think you all know me by now, but I'm Donna Esposito. I'm, I'm uh, with Pacific Rex and here with Justin Talon. And uh, I'm just delighted to tell you about a, a expedition that we took earlier in the year and what the outcome of that was. And then, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about that part of the trip for about half the talk. And I think you all know what, what plane I'm going to be talking about. And I'll tell you about the crew uh, of that plane. So just in case you're not familiar with Pacific Rex, um, just give you a couple introductory slides. So it's a nonprofit charity uh, it's been uh, been that way since 2008, but Justin Talon actually founded it back in 1995. And the mission of the organization is to locate and document missing in action personnel, as well as to research and share information on past conflicts, especially World War II in the Pacific, and also to preserve remaining historical sites and preserve their legacy for the future. So how do we actually do that? Uh, a few different ways. Uh, the one that you probably are most familiar with is the website pacificrex.com, um, which you know, Justin started way back in, in 1995 when you know, the internet was uh, pretty much brand new. And it's uh, really I think for anyone who's used it, it's found it to be the best place to find information about what was going on in the Pacific during World War II. And we also conduct oops, quite a bit of historical research uh, using primary archival records. I wonder if that's from the microphone. Oh. Okay. Uh, too close to that. Okay. All right. Uh, so we actually get a lot of requests from family members, just like the people here in this room, that maybe don't know too much about what their uh, relative did during the war. You know, maybe they're they're missing or were killed, or or maybe they just you know, never got the chance to to talk to them while they while they were alive. And so we do have a lot of people just asking us, can you tell us what uh, you know, what our relative did? And so we we do research for them. And we also collect veteran oral histories. Uh, that's something you know we feel very, very strongly about. While there's while there's still time to get firsthand accounts, uh, because everybody was there, no matter what job they were doing, had a valuable role and experience, and something that that we can all benefit from learning about. We also have library and archival collections, uh, much like the kinds of documents and photos that you've you've all shared with us today. And we also conduct field expeditions to locate and document World War II aircraft wreckages, locate missing in action personnel, and promote the preservation of these historic sites. So I'd say we spend most of our time doing the first, uh, the first four items there, but you don't want to hear me talk about sitting in front of the computer for eight hours a day uh, or, you know, going to the archives, even though we find that very, very exciting. 
So instead, I'm going to tell you about the little, little more glamorous part that we, we do, which is field expeditions. And I'll tell you about the trip that we took this year. Uh, it was to solve a mystery. Uh, an unknown plane wreck on the island of New Ireland, which is part of Papua New Guinea today. So last year, January 2017, uh, a friend of Justin's, Captain Rod Pierce, uh, who was captain of the ship MV Barbarian II, visited the southeastern coast of New Ireland. Rod is based in Rabaul, and he has been uh, exploring the area and locating plane and shipwrecks underwater for decades and is really an expert in the field. And he was visiting this uh, spot and local people came uh, out to see him in the ship and reported a wreckage to him on land and invited him ashore to see the site. Well, of course, he stays with the ship because he's the captain. And he sent his friend along. Uh, who was on the boat with him, a uh, New Zealander named Rob Rawlinson, who also lives in Raval. And he went ashore and took some photos. And so these are the first uh, photos that, that uh, we saw. And you can see uh, some local people with some, some different things here. This is the, an engine. Um, you can see wing, the star. This is also a wing um, radiator. And so he took a series of photographs, and of course he knew uh, right away by seeing the star on the wing, he was looking at an American plane rather than a Japanese plane, but didn't know what kind of plane. And so um, Rod Pierce sent those photos to Justin Talon for identification, and Justin was able to identify the plane uh, as a consolidated B-24 Liberator bomber, um, immediately based on looking at the landing gear, the engines, um, so knew exactly what kind of plane it was, but didn't know specifically which B-24 it was. And of course, it's very important because potentially this could be the site of missing in action servicemen. So that meant a trip back to the site on New Ireland was necessary to identify the plane. So just so we're all on the same page, I know that most of you spent more time looking at maps of the South Pacific than most people, but just uh, orient us a little bit. So first here's Hawaii, Australia, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, there's Guadalcanal. This is the island of New Britain and revolves over here and this little skinny island next to it, just to the east, is New Ireland. And we, you know, we were talking last last night about uh, um, Vanuatu, called the New Hebrides during the war. It's right here, and New Caledonia is down here. Here's Fiji. So this is the this is the area, and then and of course going up here um, that the fifth bomb group served in. So a little bit more of a close up here. Um, here's New Ireland in 1943. Here's Guadalcanal down here in the Solomon Islands. And initially, um, you know, the 5th Bomb Group was flying from Guadalcanal, eventually moved up to Linda, New Georgia, and um, eventually up, uh, was able to fly from places like um, Bougainville. So again, here's New Britain. Rabaul is right up here, and New Ireland here. New, New Ireland was a Japanese-held island. Um, New Britain, although we eventually did uh, land on New Britain, Rabaul was remained in Japanese hands throughout the entire war. So I will tell you about our return trip, and you'll get to see where we went. So in April, we went to uh, went to New Ireland uh, again with with Rod Pierce and his crew. So our team consisted of the, the Barbarian crew, Captain Ryan Pierce, uh, his friend Rob Rawlinson from New Zealand, who uh, was the one who took the initial photos and had been to the site, and then uh, Shane Woodgate, an Australian, and then uh, uh, 
two two women that uh, take care of everybody on the ship, uh, Dorothy uh, Nathan and Rebecca Philp, and uh, they also came ashore with us, so very handy to have along. Our team from the U.S., uh, Pacific Rex team, led by Justin Talon. We also had uh, volunteer Steve Kleiman along, uh, who is uh, serving as photographer, and uh, I was there as well. So, um, again, let's see the map. You can see we, we met Rob and, and uh, Rod and his team in New Ireland at Rabal and had to prepare the boat, fuel it. Uh, you can see here's our, here's our fuel getting, it's just delivered. And the boat is actually not, not this one in front, thankfully, it's the one behind it. And uh, we sailed from Rabal down around the coast of New Ireland. So just to give you a little idea of where we left from, here's a lovely view of Rabal, Simpson Harbor, and this is the place that the 5th Bomb Group was always going to bomb. And uh, this was a huge Japanese base during the war. It remained in Japanese hands throughout the war. It was bypassed, but uh, right up until the end of, end of the war, it was uh, a target. And it's really stunning. It's absolutely gorgeous. Well, you know, many volcanoes surrounding it. It's a natural harbor. Um, absolutely beautiful place. So we departed from there, and you can see it's it's uh, it's not exactly built up, but you can see there there are plenty of buildings. And we left uh, one evening, and the next morning found ourselves in a very uh, lovely place. I don't know. Hopefully this looks a little bit better further back than, than it does up close. I don't know if you can see um, if it's too dark, but we found ourselves at Matar on the southeastern coast of New Ireland, and very pristine, uh, tiny village, uh, and really only accessible by boat. So no no development, no tourists, really um, just just the people that live there. So they came out to greet us. Um, Rob, had, uh, Rod Pierce had promised to come back and did. So they were expecting him. Uh, people were excited to see us. Came out to the boat and uh, and greeted us and and took us ashore. So here we are going ashore in our in our dinghy and to this really idyllic uh, spot. And these are the same people that that uh, had originally accompanied um, Rod and Rob ashore. And here's just another little shot of Natar, the village. Here's here's the boat and the barbarian in the background. You can see it's uh it's it's pretty much paradise. Not that not that I want to make you jealous, but you're probably all gonna want to sign up for the uh, the return trip after this because <laughs> And um, so this, you know, this is the, the spot we, we landed on, absolutely gorgeous, but we, we weren't here to lounge on the beach or go swimming. So basically got right to work. Uh, Justin began by interviewing the local people. Uh, this man here um, is a man named Barat, and uh, he said we could call him boss, and we did. And he told us about um, about the, the wreck, he said he was about 50 years old, has known about the wreck for probably that many years, so they, they did know about it, but not a lot of people come to visit them. So uh, when Rod Rawlinson went ashore, he was the first outsider to see that wreck. And so he also told us that they had a story that had been passed down through the years about seeing parachutes, seeing people parachute out. Um, they did say they didn't know what happened to those people. So we, we think probably could be um, people from the, the plane that we're looking at, but we, we don't really know. So then it was time to leave the beach, and here Borat is uh, pointing the way of where we're going. So we're going into some some, uh, some jungle straight away. There's, you can see there's there's a sandy beach, but not, not too deep, actually. So I'm going to try 
playing a, a, a little video to give you an idea of uh, what that's <laughs> like. Go on top, huh? Go on top, huh? Help him uh, this one, Mary. Good boy. Good. So you can see that our, that our guides, this terrain is nothing for them. They're barefoot, wearing shorts and t-shirts. You know, I had my best hiking gear and even my, my, my trekking pole from L.L. Bean and I still needed help. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, but it was just a, a regular walk for them. So really, I can't stress enough how important it is, the, the, the help that the local people have given us in this, in this process. So we, we, uh, proceeded ahead and I'm going to show you a second clip, finding the first piece of wreckage. My name is Justin Talon from Pacific Rex. We're here in New Ireland looking for missing in action aircraft. This is the first piece of wreckage of a B-24 Liberator. With the help of the community, we hope to look at the crash site and ideally find the serial number or constructor number of the plane that will definitively identify this as what B-24 exactly. Because of this location on New Ireland, this could be associated with a 5th Air Force B-24. It also could be associated with a 13th Air Force B-24 from Guadalcanal or even a U.S. Navy PB-4Y, which was the Navy equivalent of the B-24. So right now, all we know is it's a B-24 aircraft. It's built in the United States, but we don't know which plane precisely yet. So we really went to this with an, an open mind. We had no idea. As Justin said, it could have been from a number of, of different units. Um, and the other thing I want to stress is that we went to the site under the assumption that it was a missing in action site, that there would be human remains there and that we would not be disturbing them, we would just be documenting things and reporting them to the agency, the, um, uh, the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, which, which handles the identification and repatriation of remains. And so our job was really to identify this plane and leave the site as, as um, untouched as, as we found it. So we started off looking at every single piece. And um, you know, here Justin's uh, photographing each piece. We, we meticulously and painstakingly looked at every piece we came across. And there are a lot of pieces. So as I said, this, and you can see this is on a very steep hillside. And the pieces were scattered down this hillside um, probably the plane had impacted higher up and just erosion over the years had washed pieces down, but um, we did not see huge sections of, the, of a plane. We did not see an intact plane by any means. We saw lots of pieces. And you can see here, you know, engine parts, um, turbo supercharger in the background, the, the propeller shaft here. Um, they're most likely thousands of pieces um, and it just made me think about the care that went into putting this plane together um, by consolidating the workers there and I thought about the workers putting it together and you know having it end up in this this state so it was clearly you could see a very violent impact that had uh, had caused this damage here's here's one of the engines um, we did see all four engines, and this was one of the, the things we were hoping to do, of course, is find 
the serial numbers for the plane. We, uh, there are individual part numbers on just about every piece. Most of those pieces, the part numbers will be the same for every B-24. There are a few pieces that have unique numbers. One of them is the engines. We knew that if we found numbers on the engines, but unfortunately, just because of um, fire and damage, you know, we, we were not able to find any, any numbers on the engines. But we knew there were also plenty of other places to find either a unique serial number or manufacturer's number. Um, here again is a, a turbo supercharger. We saw them. Th these have a special place in my heart because they uh, were designed by General Electric, and that's uh, based in my uh, my adopted hometown, Schenectady, New York. So always exciting to see something from Schenectady. And uh, you know, we just really combed every piece of it, and you know, big or small, of course, skin of the plane we were very interested in potentially would have numbers stenciled. So the pieces were really widely scattered up the hillside. Um, this was, you know, one of one of the one of the larger pieces here. Again, um, supercharger, um, but also much smaller pieces. So here, this is a, a piece of the plexiglass. From we did not actually see the nose or cockpit of the plane. Um, it's in the in the end. I think we we concluded that probably the impact of the plane to the hillside had damaged it and then erosion down had, had for, for further up had buried it. So probably um, there, but, but, but buried. And of course that, you know, had we seen intact cockpit that, that would have probably helped us with the identification. So, you know, looking at everything, you can just also see the steepness of the hillside here. And um, turned out this was a good thing. Uh, so, the, <laughs> at least for me, I was going very slowly. This was, uh, you know, it, it was a good excuse because it was so so steep. It was a good excuse to go very slowly and look at each part closely. So this particular patch was especially steep. So I was taking my, my time and, uh, you know, looking at each piece <clears throat> just to catch my breath. Um, took a look into this section of the main spar of the wing, saw some stenciling, um, and, and uh, got very excited. I called Justin over, and uh, he agreed, and so I'll just play a little clip of that as well. Hi, I'm Justin Talon of Pacific Rex. And I'm Donna Esposito, also with Pacific Rex. We're here in New Ireland, Papua New Guinea, and Donna Esposito may have just identified this B-24 Liberator. Donna, what did you find? I um, was climbing up this very steep hillside, saw the inside here of the um, engine um, mount, and saw very large stencils, B-24D, and then smaller uh, stencils right beside it, um, uh, 9, 982. And, uh, we're hoping that corresponds to the manufacturer number, a consolidated manufacturer number of this plane. If so, that'll link to the serial number, and we'll know who belonged to this plane and what day it crashed. So, to show you what was what was in there, you can see um, the B twenty four, and this was the next part D. Other stenciling ahead of that, see it a little bit better in the next photo or a different photo, but um, this is the number 982. Also, the, the uh, consolidated manufacturer's mark was stamped in there. So we were pretty excited to find this, but that wasn't, uh, we, weren't, we weren't celebrating and going, going back to the, 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 the beach to relax. Um, we kept going with the goal of finding hopefully the serial number the, the, that the Army Air Force would have assigned to the plane, uh, or perhaps another uh, repeated um, instance of the manufacturer's number. So we really had hoped to find a second positive identification on the plane. So we so we kept looking, um, kept surveying it, kept taking, taking photos, looking at each piece carefully. 
came across that wing section again that um, it showed you in the first photo. Uh, there's the star. So, you know, in the end, we, uh, we actually never found an additional number on, on the piece. It's, it's certainly possible there was one there that we missed, um, but we looked at things pretty closely. We're not able to find a second one. Uh, but we, so we did go back to the boat at that, that time. So the big question was, we had the manufacturer's number that Consolidated gave it, 982. So the question is, what plane is that? And most importantly, what happened to the crew of that plane? Would, would there be, would there be remains associated with that? And so we went back aboard the ship and, um, well, for as difficult as uh, hiking in the jungle is, the, mo the more difficult thing is not having internet access. You really miss that uh, when, you don't, when you don't have it. So thankfully, Justin had, um, uh, I think, all of Pacific Rex, uh, you know, loaded offline on his computer, which we were able to have access to, as well as other information about serial number, construction number of pairs. But it was not as straightforward as if we had just been at, at home with our high-speed internet. So, you know, working back, comparing numbers, we decided that the number corresponded to 40, 41, 24187. But when we looked up that plane, it wasn't lost in combat. It was lost on the ground on Tarawa. So um, pretty, pretty far away, not, if, not, uh, not anywhere near there, definitely not the plane we just saw. So then we looked at the next number thinking, well, you know, maybe things, maybe things got a little mixed up at some point. Well, as it happened, the next number made a whole lot of sense. Corresponded to a different plane. And it was, so we decided then it matched descriptions of the next number, 4124186. And the, the spars may have been swapped or the plane's numbers were reversed. And, and Justin did uh, ask for some, uh, ask some other P-24 experts and they, they felt that was very likely. So we were pretty confident this is the, the plane we were looking at. And this plane was assigned to the 13th Air Force, 5th Bomb Group, which is obviously why I'm here today, the headquarters squadron, and was known as Pretty Prairie Special. So I think this is a plane you all know about, and a pretty uh, stunning one, you know. Uh, and we knew that we were, it made sense from where we were. So let me tell you just a tiny bit about Pretty Prairie Special. As you know, it uh, was flown by Colonel Marion Daniel Unruh, and he was the commanding officer of the entire Thick Bomb Group. And he named this plane after his hometown of Pretty Prairie, Kansas. So initially, missions were being flown from Kearney Field on Guadalcanal and later from Linda um, on New Georgia the, in the Solomon Islands. We know that this plane completed at least 21 missions um, it's, and possibly more. We may, I'm not sure if we have all the, uh, all the mission data on it, if we've sifted through that yet. But we know his last mission was December 30th, 1943. And I'm not gonna give you a huge amount of information on the last mission. Um, hopefully you all got the Tailwinds newsletter uh, that uh, Joanne is the editor of. She wrote an excellent article, very comprehensive about Pretty Prairie Special. And so that includes a lot of details about its, its loss and the, and the last mission. So I'll give you some brief information, but uh, I think we'll, I'll focus on some other things. So on December 30th, 1943, day before New Year's Eve, the crew took off from Munda and, uh, to go bomb Reval, the beautiful harbor that uh, I showed you at the beginning that we, we uh, sailed from. And they did reach the target, did bomb the target. They were intercepted by, by fighters, suffered from dam suffered damage. Um, other pilots said that the bomb bay doors were, uh, could not be closed, they were open, reported seeing explosions on the plane, the plane kept flying. 
and it was last seen, this is a little map that was in the missing air crew report. This is uh, Rabal here. This is New Ireland and was last seen around here. Well, this is uh, right where we found the plane. So it was definitely in the right place at the right time. So what happened next? Well, again, I'm not going to tell you huge amounts of information about this because it's also in uh, Joanne's article. But obviously the loss of this plane was a huge loss. It was the commanding officer of the entire bomb group and not just any commanding officer, but one who was very beloved by his whole group. So the next day, five B-24s went to look for their commanding officer. And two of those planes spotted them, found the crew on a beach on the southern coast of New Ireland. And they were flown by two men, Captain Oscar Henry and Lieutenant James Donald Robinson, Robertson. And uh, it's absolutely astonishing to me to go from reading about this to a few months later meeting Oscar Fitzhenry, who just celebrated his 97th birthday, and now, just these past couple days, getting to know the great nephew of Lieutenant Robertson, Jim, who's here today and, and uh, has been been uh, involved in this bomb group uh, association for many years. So it's, it's uh, truly amazing to be able to have, have uh, made these personal connections with people so intricately tied to the story. So the crews of these planes, of course, were ecstatic, dropped their own medical supplies and rations down to their friends on the beach, and Oscar's plane managed to take photos of those men on the beach. Right away, they both sent their coded messages back to headquarters to let them know they had found the crew, at least, at least eight members of the crew. As it turns out, nine members of the crew. And so they were, they were pretty excited. That was uh, a, a pretty good uh, gift for New Year's Eve. Well, as it turned out, for whatever reason, which is still not completely clear, um, those men were not picked up. It's also somewhat unclear to me exactly how many PBYs went to look for them. Definitely on January 3rd, um, one went, I think, think they went even before that, but unfortunately, by the time any had gone, the crew was gone. And they actually discontinued searches on January 4th because they didn't want to keep drawing attention to that area. So remember, they had crashed on a Japanese-held island. So it was amazing to be able to see the photos that were taken from Oscar Fitzhenry's plane that day. And I'm going to show you three of those, those photos. And you can see here men on that beach. And even a canoe, some logs, another, another canoe. The, um, you can see part of the plane there as well. So these are just amazing pictures. Again, you know, men up there. So, you know, abs absolutely ecstatic um, to have found, found the men, be able to report them, report back saying, here's exactly where they are, go get them. Um, and unfortunately, for whatever reason, that, that did not happen. So we were, we, were, uh, we were pretty excited about this and right away shared the news with our hosts at uh, Village in New Ireland, Natar. So here's Justin uh, telling the, the guys who had just, who had shown us the plane, um, showing them this is what, this is, this is the plane. This is, and this is what had happened to the crew. And they were extremely interested to, to, find, to find this information. And they invited us to come ashore and tell the rest of their village. Uh, so, so here's Justin showing one of the elders um, on, on, uh, in the village, picture of the Pretty Prairie crew here in front of the plane and, and, and that photo of the beach. And so 
to us, it didn't look like the same place. The, the width of the sand looked different and all, but you know, we didn't know the plane was there. It seemed possible it was the same place. Well, we, we asked, uh, Justin asked the people on the, uh, that um, showed us the plane first, and they said, no, 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 that's not here. It's a, it's a village called Backup. And then, again, he asked um, and, uh, other people ashore, and they all said the same thing. So they, they said, no, you know, told us where to go, recognized it immediately as, as, as uh, not their village, but a village further south and, and uh, around a, a little point on uh, the shore. So, you know, they, they were, I, I can't tell you, I can't stress enough how wonderful the people of Natar were, how they welcomed us, and how much they cared about, about what had happened to the people on the plane. And so they actually invited us uh, uh, back the next day, it was a Sunday, to attend church with their church services with them, which we did. It was really an honor. And uh, you know, had had a ceremony and uh, paid tribute to the crew of Pretty Prairie Special. And then they sent us on our way to, uh, to go and visit the site where those photos were taken. So back aboard the boat, um, Rod sailed uh, where they told him to go. And we soon found ourselves looking at a beach that looked very familiar. And here we are uh, uh, going, sure you can see that, that beach in the background. So, so quite a bit different than where we had just come from where the vegetation was very close to the shore. Here's a, a wide sandy beach. And here's Justin showing the people of Backhop those same photos and right away they said yes that's uh that's our that's our village you're in the right place they didn't remember or have any story passed down about pretty prairie special and her crew um there was the oldest person i i don't think she was old enough to have been alive then um, so unfortunately no no oral oral history of that um, survived. So just to show you those pictures again, here's here's the photo taken by Oscar Fitzhenry's plane, the man on the beach. And here's what it looks like today. So really not that different. Um, maybe you know, a few more houses in the background. So Justin took some amazing drone footage, really gorgeous footage of that to kind of simulate the view that the guys in, in the B-24s took. And they flew extremely low. Um, in fact, it seemed like each each account I read had them flying just a little bit lower till they were only flying about 50 feet from, from the ground. Um, so not, uh, not, not quite sure how low they got, but they got awfully low. And... Um, you know, did drop, did everything they could for, for their friends down on the beach. So I'm, I'm also going to show you just a, a little bit of the drone footage here. Uh, can, can play this as smoothly as it should. Not, it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous, stunning, stunning location. And you can see we're, we had a group of us here on, on the beach and it was really an honor to be able to stand there and and uh, think about those men that we knew stood on the beach. Well, I think most of you or maybe all of you know what happened to them, but I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about what happened to them. So their last crew consisted of 11 men, pilot Colonel Henry, uh, and then this, these uh, list of 10 other men, I'm going to tell you about each one of them. And they're listed, these, the, this information comes from the missing air crew report, and in some cases these are their hometowns, but in some cases not, it might be just where their, their um, next of kin was living. So I'm going to tell you about each one. and. Um, it's really, for me, as much as I enjoyed being in the field, for me, 
being back in front of the computer and finding out about these men um, has really been very meaningful. And especially because it's led me to meet uh, all of you and uh, including some other families who couldn't be here today. And I'm gonna tell you, I could give you an hour presentation about each one of these men. They would certainly deserve it and more. And uh, it's really, for me, an honor to be able to, to talk about them and remember them. So I'm gonna start kind of from the bottom of the list, which isn't where we usually start when we're talking about crews, but everybody in the crew is absolutely crucial. So of those men on the list, the 11 men, only one man survived, Colonel LaRue. The rest of them died, either that, that day in the, in the crash or within the next couple of months. So I'll tell you about, about each one. First, um, Staff Sergeant Albert Shaffron. He was a photographer and gunner on the plane. And he was born July 31st 1909 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So a little bit older, and he was a son of Russian Jewish immigrants. Um, very modest background. He worked in 1930. He was working as a clerk in a gross paper and in a wallpaper store. Um, before the war, immediately before the war, he was working at Reliant Steel Products in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, which is outside of Pittsburgh. He enlisted December 12th. 1941, so uh, patriotic there, and uh, listed right after Pearl Harbor. So he was not one of those men on the beach. It was believed that he bailed out, but he was never seen again. So he is listed as missing in action. And he is memorialized on the walls of the missing in the Manila American Cemetery. You can see him here, Albert Schaffron, Headquarters Squadron, 5th Bomb Group Heavy in Pennsylvania. So unfortunately, I haven't been able to speak to anybody from his family. I've located a few people and I've reached out to them, but I haven't heard back, but I will, I will keep trying. Um, here's a photo of him that was printed in the Pittsburgh newspaper, and unfortunately, he was not the only person in that photo on the crew. So Pittsburgh kind of paid a heavy price in this one. Next person I'll tell you about, Staff Sergeant Romulus F. Mall. He was a gunner. He was born June 25th, 1924 in Valdez, North Carolina. So pretty young. Remember, this is end of 1943. Also modest background, worked as a salesperson for the John Massey Company, as, as best I can figure, as kind of a hardware store and they made pipe fittings. Uh, he enlisted, um, as I said, he was much younger than, uh, than Chaffron, enlisted November 18th, 1942. He was one of the men on the beach and of those men on the beach, there were nine, nine men survived, and um, seven of them were captured later the, later the same day that photograph was taken, and, and they were taken to Rabaul and held as a prisoner of war. And Romulus Mull was executed along with um, five of the other men on March 5th, 1944, in what's known as the Tunnel Hill Massacre. And he's buried in the Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery as part of a group burial. And I know some of you have been there to see it and, and even had um, a memorial service, which um, I think is just a, a wonderful thing. And he was, he was part of that, um, part of that tragic massacre and um, his, his commingled remains are, are buried there. And I'll just mention a couple things. Um, he does have a living brother, and I was able to talk to um, Mull's 
nephew, who David Mole, who is actually an airline pilot, and he said one of the things he remembers when he was a little boy was being allowed to wear his uncle's wings, and uh, that stayed with him, and he became a pilot. And so um, he didn't have any photos. They were they were trying to look for some family photos that showed him, but. I'll share a couple things with you. He he does have his own uh, memorial stone, of course, just memorial um, in the family cemetery. Prisoner of Japanese killed at Rabaul. And the other thing, he was quoted in a newspaper article. U.S. airmen left Rabaul Harbor in one hell of a mess. And uh, it says land-based... I'll read, read it out to you. Land-based liberators, led by Colonel Marion Unruh, tapped warships and cargo ships lying in the bay outside Simpson Harbor. Colonel Unruh was attacked by at least two of five Zeros, which rose to intercept. These two were shot down with credit for the kills going to Unruh's gunners. Now, this is a slightly different crew, but his gunners were Sergeant Romulus Mull, Kannapolis, North Carolina, James Ray, Peoria, Illinois, and William D. Morris of Fort Smith, Arkansas. Two zeros came at us head on, Mull said. One split off while the first was making his pass. Ray, in the top turret, blasted away at him, and he went under as I gave him a long burst and he broke into flames. The number two zeros circled off. I smashed into him, and the jet broke up into four burning pieces. It just uh, gives you a little idea of the danger that they uh, they faced each and every time they went up there. And I'll just share one other little bit of information about uh, Romulus Mall. So he had some talents that included music. And I found a little article um, from... December 9th, 1942, um, St. Petersburg, uh, actually the Tampa Bay Times, happened to mention that his squadron was treated last week to a big show and community sing in uh, the day room of the Sorrento Hotel. And it mentions <coughs> uh, among the acts that they enjoyed were the hillbilly numbers of privates Willie Smith, James Edwards, Romulus Mall. Leonard Simpson and Bob Wiley. So it sounds like uh, he was an interesting guy and uh, well, made an impression on, uh, on those around him. So the next person I'm going to tell you about, very exciting, because we have his family here today. And it's Staff Sergeant Edward T. Constantine. Also a gunner, uh, born July 8, 1916, in Rockaway Beach, New York, but moved with his family to New Jersey, attended high school in Asbury Park, New Jersey. And another talented and interesting person, he was an actor. And you can see here an article from the local paper, former actor, lost on rate. And he played with the Monmouth Players of the Deal Conservatory, Asbury Park. And the census record uh, for 1940 actually listed his profession as singer. But he had a day job as well. And uh, immediately before the war, was working for the National Biscuit Company in New York. And he'd married a woman named Martha Ann Moody of Waynesville, North Carolina, in 1940. He enlisted July 8, 1942. And he was captured by the Japanese and held as a, as a POW at Rabaul. And sadly, he was also part of that Tunnel Hill massacre. And his remains are part of that group burial at Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery. And uh, it's just really um, an honor to have the Ugaldi family here today. Um, so I found them. Um, Joe Ugaldi is quite an accomplished genealogist and family historian. And 
and uh, I was really delighted to, to make contact with him through Ancestry.com, and uh, he really done some marvelous research, and I have to say, the rest of his family is, is also quite interesting and talented as well. Um, Edward's sister is a beautiful woman who was an actress as well, and, and uh, she herself had a, had a tragic story and didn't live too many years longer than, than her brother. Uh, to uh, wonderful people, and it's and it's just great that um, that that uh, Tom and Debbie. So so let me see if I get it right. So so Joe's grandmother was Edward's cousin. So so that would be Tom's mother was Edward's cousin, and it's wonderful to have Tom and Debbie and, and their their son Joe here today, all the way from New Jersey. And uh, it's just, uh, I, I, I think it's wonderful to be able to remember him today. So, and I'll tell you about Sergeant John J. Gillis, Jr. He was an assistant radio operator on the plane. He was born in 1916 in Michigan, but he grew up in Chicago, and he worked at an automotive dealer doing welding and auto body work. He enlisted March 5th, 1941. Uh, he was already in, in the Illinois National Guard and became so active duty. And he was also one of the men on the beach and was captured. For some reason, um, he was not one of the men executed in the Tunnel Hill Massacre. In that massacre, there were about 68, I think, prisoners being held, and at one point, they took a group of 20 men out and, um, and, and executed them, and then did the same thing again for another group of 20. For whatever reason, he was not among that group, but sadly, he died later on, uh, August 2nd, 1944, of disease and malnutrition, and it was uh, really unbelievably harsh uh, inhumane conditions they were living under. So when he died, he was buried on the hall. And remarkably, the location of his grave was identified and, and remained known throughout, throughout that time. And he was then exhumed and reburied in the Manila American Cemetery. And he has an individual grave there that contain his remains, and, and here's a photograph of his. And so I found uh, relatives of his, his nephew, um, Dennis Timrick, and I uh, was uh, very fortunate to talk to Dennis and, and uh, his wife, Wendy, and they, of course, knew about him, provided this wonderful photograph of him um, in the days before he joined the, the, the fifth bomb group. And they didn't actually know that he was buried. Um, they, they knew he'd been killed. They thought he was missing. So um, they, were, they were quite pleased to find out that he actually does have a grave in Manila. And in fact, he's the only one with a individual grave of, of the whole crew. Uh, I'll tell you about Staff Sergeant Roy Bixler. He's a radio operator. He was born March 11th, 1918, Salem, Ohio. And he worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad as a railroad crossing watchman. Uh, and the interesting thing about him is he, he was already an amateur shortwave radio operator. He'd gotten his FCC license in 1934. He enlisted January 21st, 1941. And he, like uh, Albert Schaffron, was never seen again. Uh, it was believed that he bailed out of the crew, but he was not one of the men on the beach, was not captured. So he is missing in action. And like Shaffron, is memorialized um, the, the walls of the missing in Manila. He has a memorial grave in his, in his hometown. Um, and I was lucky enough also to, to um, speak to or communicate with his nephew and he mentioned uh, to me about 
his uh, radio operator um, license and uh, was also also mentioned that uh, that's been a tradition that's been carried on in their family and that that um, so his his nephew David Bixler uh, also has an amateur radio license as do his sons so it's been uh, three generations where they, they've continued that tradition on. And I'll tell you about Sergeant Vincent Wasilewski. He was an assistant engineer in the plane. And he's the other person from the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. He was born December 18th, 1919 in Duquesne, Pennsylvania, right outside of Pittsburgh. He was the son of Lithuanian immigrants and worked as a steel worker at the Carnegie, Illinois Steel Corp. Corporation in Duquesne. Enlisted September 15th, 1941. And he uh, also was one of the men on the beach who was captured, held as a prisoner of war, and executed in the Tunnel Hill Massacre and as, as part of that group burial. And uh, again, I have um, located family members. Unfortunately, they haven't responded, but I'm going to keep trying and uh, hopefully get to talk to somebody from there, but he was on that same newspaper page as Albert Schaffrin, um, the um, missing that uh, in, in the Pittsburgh area. And he had a, a brother, Stephen, who was in the Marine Corps. And I'll tell you about engineer Staff Sergeant Lawson Stewart, born May 10th, 1914, Jones County, uh, Mississippi, worked as a truck driver in 1940. He married a woman named Ethel Reeves of Summit in 1941. And interestingly, he worked at Consolidated Aircraft mm -hmm. in San Diego as a sheet metal worker before enlisting in 1942. And so pretty, pretty special, rolled off the assembly line about two months after he, he had left. But uh, it's interesting to think about. He may well have worked on some planes that ended up in the fifth bomb group uh, a few months later. And he was one of the men on the beach. He was captured as, and held as a prisoner of war at Rabaul, executed March 5th in the Tunnel Hill Massacre and buried in the group cemetery. Um, Joanne Emmerich was able to connect me with his great niece, uh, uh, Paige Sparks Fontaine, and she's provided us with this uh, beautiful portrait of him. And his his widow, Ethel, um, never remarried, and she died in about I think, 2000, 2007. And her tombstone here also, also mentions him. And uh, now I'll tell you a little bit about Lieutenant Anthony Kuhn, the bombardier of the plane. Born uh, Dickinson, North Dakota, May 21st, 1917, son of Russian German immigrants. He was working as an accountant for the Public Roads Administration in Alaska and enlisted November 18th, 1941. And he had a rather harrowing um, incident not long before this. He was, he survived a ditching, a water landing um, of the Lieutenant Wilson's plane, B-24, known as Big George, on November 3rd, 1943. And in fact, last night, Joanne showed us some footage of uh, men being rescued after, after a water landing. One of the men in that footage was Tony Kuhn. So sadly, he uh, you know, spent some time recovering from his injuries. And the first mission that he flew after that was on Pretty Prairie Special. So um, this time, not a water landing, but bailed out, captured again, and held and executed as part of that massacre. And uh, Joanne also connected me to his nephew, Dale Anderson, who's provided these photos and uh, is actually in the process of writing the book, telling his story. And uh, very grateful for him, to Dale, for all the information he shared about his uncle and coming to meet with us. And I realize I'm, I'm seem to be taking a lot longer than I had planned, but uh, I hope you'll, hope you'll bear with me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, if you just like, just, you know, if, if it's 
too much to say now. We don't want to hear anymore. But um, I, I can. I hope you can see. I feel pretty strongly about these guys. I've been been reading about them and trying to find out about them for a while. So I, uh, they're close to my heart, even though I'm you know, not a relative. But uh, I'll tell you about the navigator, Major Frederick Kobig. He was born November 15, 1917 in Los Angeles and attended UCLA. And as far as I can tell, he was what they, what they call the big man on campus. He was quite the guy, president, student body president of his class at UCLA, captain of the crew team. He was in the ROTC, um, very attractive looking man. I found no shortage of newspaper articles uh, of him surrounded by a bunch of girls. <laughs> So it seemed to be quite popular, uh, and he, was, since he was in the ROTC, he was in the reserves, but he actually went on active duty starting August 15th, 1941, and he was actually at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, and uh, he was also captured by the Japanese and executed in that March 6th execution. And he's one of the people I have located, a fa family member, but unfortunately I haven't yet responded to my inquiries, but hopefully they will soon. Brings us to the co-pilot, Thomas Fessinger. And he was born August 12th, 1919 in Vernon, Texas, as Robert Simmons. And uh, his mother, they moved to Oklahoma, and his mother... Uh, remarried. Later they ended up in San Jose, California, and Robert uh, took his stepfather's name, his entire name, Thomas Fessinger. He, he uh, was adopted by him and, and uh, really loved his, his stepfather. He was a student, an English student at San Jose State University, enlisted December 20th, 1941, and he was captured by the Japanese, but not at the same time as the rest of the men that I've told you about. So on that day, when the photograph was taken, the men on the beach, he was there, Colonel Unruh was there. Later that night, they were all in a, in a hut, and um, remember they were in Japanese-held island. Japanese came, started firing into the hut, it was chaos. And Fessinger, as well as uh, Colonel Unruh, managed to escape capture at that point, later found each other, managed to hide out in the jungle on the run, uh, eventually also lost track of each other, but they were both captured about the same time, that uh, January 15th. So he he and, and uh, Colonel Unruh were, were uh, uh, in, in, in hiding for, for about two weeks. So he was uh, captured, taken to a ball. Colonel Unruh did actually not, not know what had happened to him uh, since they had been separated. And he was not executed as part of that massacre, but sadly he did die of disease and neglect later in July of 1944. And uh, like um, Sergeant Gillis, he was buried, but there's basically his remains have been lost. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention how where this information came from at, at the end of my presentation. So he is listed as missing in action, even though his remains were at one point accounted for. Um, and he's memorialized in the tablets of the, of the missing in Manila. And that brings us to the person that everybody knows here, um, pilot of the plane, Colonel Mario Daniel Unruh, uh, born February 20th, 1910, in Prairie Prairie, Kansas, oldest man, uh, Actually, uh, not quite the oldest man on the crew, almost. Joined the Air Corps Reserves on June 29, 1932. Saw active duty off and on throughout the 1930s, including in the Canal Zone. And uh, married his wife, Yozelle Davis, in 1933. His sons, Jack and Jesse, were born then, uh, 1935 and 1936. And Jesse shared with us that... Um, he was born at sea on one of those trips going to the canal zone, um, which caused him a little bit of uh, administrative problems in later life. But uh, I'm very 
unbelievably grateful for Jesse making the trip here to see us today, sharing his recollections of his father, um, telling us what it was like growing up, what he remembers about that time, and uh, just uh, really, really very special. So thank you, Jesse. So Colonel Unruh became commanding officer of the 5th Bomb Group on August 10th, 1943. And he flew a lot of missions. And that's, uh, there were a lot of things that stood out about him, and I'm going to mention a few more things. So he was one of the men on the beach, as I mentioned, managed to escape, evaded capture for about two weeks, held as a prisoner of war at Rabaul. Because he was a high-ranking officer, he was valuable to them. They thought perhaps he had information. Um, he was, we know from records that Jesse brought today that he was on Rabaul for a month. He was held in solitary confinement. He was transferred to Japan, and that's really what saved his life, most likely. Uh, he, was, he saw a variety of prison camps, eventually ending up at the Roko Roshi camp near Osaka. And he survived, and he was the only member of the Pretty Prairie crew to survive. He retired from the Air Force in 1959, and I think most of you probably know he, um, he died tragically in a plane accident in 1968, but, um, you know, it was clear today, talking with Jesse, he loved to fly. It was the best thing in his life, and uh, um, it was just clear that he belonged. He belonged in, in, in the air, and uh, it was wonderful that, that he got to do that. So I just, again, if I, if you'd like me to stop now, I will, but I have a couple more things to share with you. Is it, is it okay to keep going? Okay, thank you. I, I, let me share, I don't know if you've seen, have you seen the, this booklet produced by the 13th Bomber Command in the field? The story of the 13th Bomber Command at work, January 1943 to July 1944. Are you, are you all, are you familiar with this? Well, this, uh, this is actually available on Fold 3. So this was produced, as it says, um, you know, on Guadalcanal. And at this point, Colonel Unruh was missing. And there was a little section on each of, uh, each of the commanding officers that, that the group had had. And so I'll just read a little bit. I don't know if you can see that. But um, it says... Back in Pretty Prairie, Under had a farm, of which he was very proud. On the farm, he'd applied the principles of his engineering training to the problem of growing food. In the Army, he continued to apply his inventive ability, this time to the B-24, which he understood thoroughly. Early in the game, he realized the need for more firepower in the B-24 and its particular vulnerability to attacks from the front and from below. So the tinkerer set to work improvised a nose turret from a discarded tail turret and installed a belly turret from a B-17 in one of the Liberators. This proved very satisfactory, and after numerous tests at the Hawaii Air Depot, the invention was adopted universally. And it also goes on to say, Colonel Henry was a great favorite with members of his command, and it is said that he knew every private by his first name. Frequently, he would wander down to the maintenance shops and pitch in on an engine change or lend a hand in machine work. He insisted on leading all dangerous missions against heavily defended targets and endeared himself to his crews and ground personnel by his courage and daring. His own self-discipline and singleness of purpose were outstanding, but he was always ready to recognize and allow for any justifiable weakness on one of his own men. He failed to return from strike against Rabaul on 30th November, or December 1943, and Terry's missing in action. Um, and so at this point when they wrote this, they did not know whether he was alive or dead, coming home or not. Um, and in fact, there had been a radio broadcast mentioning Lieutenant Fessinger, so they held out some hope that both of the men would be alive, but in fact it was just Colonel Unruh. So, also mention um, that you know we, we know here he was very beloved by his men and it's been um, 
outstanding to find so many firsthand accounts that mention him. And, and so I'll just mention Bob Hauser, which I think you, you all know, or perhaps knew him. Um, he kept a diary. He was the co-pilot of the plane Scoot and Thunder. That's the plane that Oscar Fitzhenry was flying that took photos of the men on the beach. And uh, I think actually Joanne read this last night, but uh, No, I, I, I admired his style right away. You know, he, uh, he could have remained behind the comfort of his own quarters, awaiting the results of the mission and debriefing room for the first pilots. This was not his idea of leading men. He set the example for all of us by being and remaining out front, participating along with the entire squadron. And then Captain, uh, actually, I think perhaps that, Perhaps that's a mistake. I think it's Lieutenant, but you'll correct me. Um, James Donald Robinson. Uh, Robertson. Well, I was not doing well on this slide. I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> uh, so he was flying the other plane with um, Oscar that saw the Pretty Prairie crew. And he actually went and flew along on one of the rescue missions for the PBY to look for them. And um, sadly, as you all know, he himself was later lost on August 9th, 1944. And he says in his diary, uh, Colonel Unruh was considered one of the foremost military men in this region, and every inch a fine man. He's a wonderful leader, both in the air and, and on the ground. Um, tired tonight, but you feel good when you figure you've accomplished something. Well, unbelievably, the man in flying the plane who took those photographs is still alive and had the great, great honor to meet him earlier this year, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, retired Oscar Fitzhenry, pilot of Scoot and Thunder. And so he welcomed us into his home and, uh, and spoke to us about his memories of that day. And um, I'll just play you a very brief clip of what he had to say. All of the fellows adored uh, Colonel Andrew and uh, counted him as one of them, one of us. You were the jubilation when we saw the men and saw the eight of them there, and we uh, figured that the crew, so all but two of them, made it down to the uh, safety on the shore. I tell you, I fly, I fly that mission every day, almost for 75 years. Of uh, the exhilaration that must have been in their hearts and their minds to see the two airplanes there the next morning after they've shot. I, I put myself in their place uh, of wondering, you know, what's next, what's next, uh, what happened, why aren't they, and why haven't they picked us up? And see, they never saw the PBY because they had uh, already picked up by the Japanese by the, by the time the PBY. So, 75 years, he's still alive. He spent thinking about this and uh, the loss of his friends, of Colonel and the rest of the crew, and uh, you know, was carried out with him and wondered if he could have done something differently. Of course, he couldn't. Um, so it was really a privilege to be able to meet him. And he actually asked me to tell you something. Uh, he knew I was coming here today. He wished he could be here, and. He said some, something he, he, wanted, he wanted me to mention. So, as you know, Rabaul was never captured. It was a Japanese base throughout the entire war. It was occupied from January 1942 until the end of the war. We, we bypassed it, but uh, it, was, it was a target for bombing through you know, that entire time. And um, so... When the war was over, Colonel Unruh was in the prisoner of war camp. He was the ranking officer. Um, and, and so 
the commandant of the camp surrendered to him so and, and gave him the Japanese flag allowed the American flag to be raised over the camp and gave him his samurai sword and um, Jesse's family still has the flag and, and sword and Oscar said he considers that gesture of the of the uh, Japanese commandant of Lieutenant Habe um, surrendering to Colonel Unruh as the end of the Raval campaign. And, uh, in his mind, it was finally over then. So, what did we learn about Pretty Prairie Special? Well, first we know that the crew bailed out. There was some confusion over the years, thinking that they had possibly made a water landing, even though that didn't quite make sense uh, with uh, other information. So we know definitively that the plane did continue to fly and uh, crash uh, on that hillside in New Ireland. We also think there are probably no MIA remains associated with the wreckage, although there were the two crewmen who did not reassemble on that beach. Colonel Unruh believed that all of his men had bailed out. I'm inclined to believe that as well. Um, but you technically can't rule out the possibility that perhaps they, for whatever reason, had been severely wounded or were in fact already dead when the, when the plane crashed. Um, but more likely, they perhaps also bailed out and for whatever reason drowned um, or just didn't make it. So unfortunately, probably this discovery will not lead to the recovery of their remains. But it has been reported, and, uh, and, and potentially there could be an excavation to look for them. Uh, also importantly, it's now a confirmed site. It's been identified. So um, there's no mystery left about what that plane is. But for me, the most important thing about this, this whole um, expedition in the jungle was being able to be here today and uh, the chance to learn about the 11 men on that plane and who they were and what they suffered and what they were like before the war and learn about the people they left behind and uh, in, in, including um, people here today and, and the chance to meet all of you. So that's, that's um, I think, the chance to remember and, and pay tribute to, to that crew is, uh, to me, very, very important. So I'm going to just do a few acknowledgments. Of course, the Pacific Rex team, obviously, Justin Taylor led, led the expedition, and um, um, very grateful for him as well. Steve Kleiman, photography, all the photos uh, were either by um, Steve, Justin, or myself with, with, uh, um, of, the, of the site. Also, I have to acknowledge another historian for Pacific Rex, Edward Rogers. He happened to be um, back in the library for this trip and was supplying us with um, all kinds of uh, archival information. So very grateful to his help and support on this. And then uh, the crew of the, the MV Barbarian, again, of course, um, made it possible. Also, the, the people of New Ireland and uh, people in the Tar village and uh, led us to the plane, the people of Backhop couldn't have done any of this without them and very grateful for their help and uh, really appreciate that. And then all of the, the families um, of, the, of the crew, as well as, of course, um, Joanne Emmerich, when I, I first called Jesse Unruh, uh, found him right away and said, you've got to call Joanne Emmerich. And uh, she was the next person I made contact with and uh, very, very grateful to her help and her and her warmth and kindness and and, uh, and welcoming uh, that that she's given us, and so she was able to identify some of these other family members. Some of them I found, and uh, very very grateful to everybody. And I'm going to also mention another person that I really want to acknowledge, and that's Henry Sakaida. Some of you, we mentioned him very briefly. Um, some of you probably maybe know his name as a historian. Um, he was a very close friend of Justin's. Um, he 
tragically passed away after a very brief illness last month. I never got the chance to meet him in person, but I was um, able to communicate with him by email and Skype a few times and feel really honored to have met him. And the reason I mention him is he um, started this work long ago and was actually the person to investigate the case of Thomas Fessinger. And back when there really were no internet resources available, found his family, and he was able to introduce me to Fessinger's um, nephew, Chris Anderson, who was uh, kind enough to share the beautiful photos of, of his uncle with us. So I'm tremendously grateful to Henry, especially because when I shared the whole story with him and he watched the video of my first presentation, he said to me, congratulations on becoming a forensic historian. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming from a different background um, and, and uh, to be accepted uh, like that was um, a very special honor for me. And I think I, think I would, uh, I, I take that compliment as being worth more than, than uh, any degree I could have possibly earned. So he was um, a very wonderful person and will we'll surely feel his loss um, in this community. So. Um, I want to thank you for listening and apologize for taking so long, but I hope uh, I hope I didn't you know, bore anyone with the story. Um, but I, as you can see, I'm enthusiastic about about these men, and uh, so I hope hope you forgive me for going over.